All right. I believe we are set up and ready to go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mr. Batman. I'm actually going to be interviewed this evening, and I'm going to record this and stream it live on Facebook. So, um, who's going to be doing the interviewing tonight, gentlemen? I think we're still waiting on some people to join. Once again, um, I am Mr. Batman. I teach science and apologetics for all ages. Um, I do so love science because you cannot do science without the God of the Bible. And one of my favorite verses is Psalm 51:13. And again, uh, that verse says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. So, once again... Uh, we are going to be talking about... Uh-oh, why is this not working? Got no audio. Audio. Ah, da, da, audio. Hmm. Isn't that just a bummer? Hello? Hello? Uh, when you're ready, I can ask my question. Hello. Oh, okay, there we go. All right. Uh, we are live. Go ahead, sir. Ask your question. Okay, so I just want to start off with a question about theology. I've seen this graph thrown around quite a bit to try to, like, um, I guess, uh, pin down, like, believers of, a, of a specifically the Christian God. So I just wanted to know what your thoughts on this graph are. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it in the interview channel if you can take a look at it. Okay. I, I sent it right there. Just, I just want to know what your thoughts on it or how do you respond to it. <laughs> Evil exists. Well, let me ask you a question, sir. How do you define what is evil without the God of the Bible? How do you define what good is without the God of the Bible? See, it says in Romans, uh, Paul actually mentions this, that the um, Torah, the scriptures, are our schoolmaster, and it teaches us what is righteousness and what is unrighteous. Now, sir, if you're going to define something as evil, how do you do that without the God of the Bible? Well, I, from a Christian standpoint, isn't evil just anything that distances yourself from God or any action that's distanced from God? By no, the sir. Well, no, sir. No, it's not. Um, uh, evil is that which uh, goes against the nature of God, God's design for uh, you and the system that he created. Um, sin is what evil is. When you are doing something that's evil, you are going against God. That is sin. It says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, that sin is lawlessness. This is anomia. That's the original Greek there. That's without law. That's without Torah. That's without the scriptures. So basically, anything that God tells you to do, you decide not to do it. That's evil. Now, sir, I know what evil is because I have the scriptures in which to point me and say, this is evil. Sir, is there anything in your worldview that you can point to and say, I know this thing is absolutely evil? Well, I wasn't making a comment on my worldview. I just wanted to know your thoughts on the graph overall. The graph is it's irrelevant, sir, because without the God of the Bible, you cannot define what is good or what is evil. That's my whole point. It says God is good, okay? God is the foundation for what is good, just like he's the foundation for what is true. Now, sir, I can ask you what is truth. Where does truth come from, and where, how do you know that? What is evil, and how do you know that? What is knowledge, and how do you know that? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Yeshua HaMashiach. That's Jesus, the Messiah, alone. Now, sir, if you're going to quote me or po post this little scripture, or this little, basically it's your evil scripture, it says the quick and easy guide to God, evil exists. God can prevent evil. Well, then God's not all powerful. Yes, he is, sir. God allows evil. And you can't even define what evil is without the God of which you say does not exist. Okay, well, uh, thank you for your response. I just wanted your overall take on the graph. That's all I wanted. Thank you, though. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. But I want to say something to you. Again, you know that it's wrong to do certain things, sir. You know that there's absolute right and absolute wrong. You know when you've been wronged. You get mad. You get upset. Sometimes you even get sad because somebody wronged you and you know it. Wait a minute, sir. Where does this knowledge come from? 
This knowledge is called a priori knowledge. You have it built in. It comes straight from the factory, from the designer. So you can't justify how you know that it's wrong, even though you do know that things are wrong. You can't tell me why you know that. That's a problem in your worldview. But thank you again for the question. Next. Okay, we're still waiting for some more questions in the interview period. I believe. Okay, is there anybody else that has a question? Hmm. I thought this was going to be more of an interview. I guess it may just be me preaching. But if you're going to talk about, um, let's go ahead and go back to this little graph here. God is not all-powerful. If evil exists, then God could prevent evil. Yeah, he sure could. Because God could cause you to do what he wants you to do. But wait a minute, then that would take away your free will. And so that means God being all-powerful, taking away your free will, you have no ability to love him. And God says, I put before you this day life and death. That's the Torah. That's the scriptures. That's the entirety of the Bible. He puts before you life and death. And he says, these are the blessings and the curses. You get the blessings when you obey. You get the curses when you disobey. Now, you cannot tell me what is good or what is bad without the God you says, I'll get it out here. The God you say does not exist. Okay, wait a minute. Then you say the next one, um, uh, does God know about, does God know about all the evil? Um, well, no, actually God does not know all the evil. He knows all truth propositions. He knows that you are evil. He knows that you're a sinner, but he doesn't know what it's like for you to engage in that sin. Let's say that you're a murderer, sir. He knows that you're a murderer, but he doesn't know what it is to be a murderer. See, there's a difference there, sir. So God knows all truth propositions. God knows it's true that you are a sinner, but God does not know what it is to be a sinner like you. Again, sir, you can't even define what a sinner is or what even knowing is. Let's, let's look at knowing. God is not all knowing. Knowledge is a justified, true belief. Now, in order for you to know anything, it must be justifiable and it must be true. So here's a little problem with your graph again. In order to know anything at all, in order for it to be justifiable, it must be true. So if I was to say to you that I have a little apartment where I live and the street outside of my apartment, the speed limit is 35 miles an hour. And then I immediately turn to you and say, but I could be wrong. Do I know it? No, that could be a belief. Um, I could say that there's pink unicorns on the dark side of the moon. Do I know that there's pink unicorns on the dark side of the moon? No. Number one, it's not true. And number two, I can't prove it. So it's not knowledge. Knowledge must be a justified, true belief. So in order to justify anything to be true, you know what you gotta have? You have to have time, space, matter, laws of logic and laws of nature. Because guess what? We exist in the physical world. This is where we have knowledge. We know that we exist. We know such basic, simple things like one finger plus one more finger is always and only what? Two fingers. Why is that? Hmm, because we know God. Let me explain this to you, how this works. Either you would have to be all-knowing in order to know anything to be true, or you have to have a relationship with the one who is all-knowing in order to know anything to be true. Why is this? Because there could be something out there in the physical world that could prove you wrong. So, once again, if you could be wrong, then you don't know it. And since we know that one finger plus one more finger is always and only two fingers, guess what that means? That means we all have a relationship with the loving, living, logical lawgiver God who allows us to know things. And how can he do that? Because we are created in his image. And welcome back, Mr. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Is that Saitama? Okay, super. So um, did you have any questions, sir? Okay, he's typing. All right. Well, I happen to be in a voice chat called the Mr. Batman interview. And so I'm waiting on um, some different questions. He's asking me, well, um, I'm wondering what you felt about gay marriage. Well, sir, I think every marriage should be gay. I'm gay. I'm a happy, joyful, giddy person, but I'm not a homosexual pervert. Let's be clear. Um, again, there's a difference. 
I love homosexuals enough to tell them that they don't have to live against the God that they know. They don't have to live against the design of the system because God designed the natural system, the natural order to work a certain way. You know what? I love them enough to go down and preach the gospel to them. I, I, I didn't get to do it this year because they didn't have it because of COVID. But the last, I don't know, three or four years in a row, I've been going down to the Louisville, Kentucky um, homosexual pride event, and I've been preaching the gospel to these people. Salvation through the Messiah alone. And do you know what? They were not very accepting or tolerant of my message of, of peace and love and acceptance and forgiveness. As a matter of fact, last year, I was assaulted about a half a dozen times in the six hours I was down there. So um, again, I think every marriage should be gay, but let's define it properly. I'm a happy, joyful, gay kind of person. I'm very giddy. But guess what? I'm not a homosexual, okay? I'm not a pervert. A pervert is any person who takes any system whatsoever and uses that system in a way it was never designed to be used, such as, let's think about this, the sexual reproductive system. Now, two men that have sex with one another, they can never reproduce, so they are destroying the functionality of that system. That's what makes them a pervert. Now, I'm not trying to point any fingers or call anybody any names. But if you are engaging in this type of behavior, and again, the scientific definition of a pervert is anybody who takes any system whatsoever and uses that system in a way that deforms or destroys the system. That definitely destroys the function of the sexual reproductive system, just like a pedophile, just like a necrophile, a person who has sex with dead people, just like a bestiophile, somebody has sex with animals. So it doesn't matter. If you use that system in a way that it was never designed to be used, then you are a pervert. Now let me show you how you can be a cell phone pervert. You know what? If you had a girlfriend and the girlfriend gave you a picture of herself to hang on your wall, you now have a picture, you have a wall, and you have a nail, but you don't have a f hammer, but you do have your lovely cell phone. If you were to take that cell phone and you can use it and beat that nail into the wall so you can hang your picture, your cell phone would probably perform that function but you destroyed the cell phone in the process. So you just became a cell phone pervert. You see what I'm saying here, sir? So it's any system whatsoever. If you don't use it the way it was designed to be used, you have perverted that system. I'm not calling anybody any names. I just like scientific terms. Any other questions? Um, Mr. Batman, why doesn't God want people to eat pork? Well, because he calls it unclean. Now, it's a covenant between us and God. Um, God gives us, I mean, there's like uh, four different times in Leviticus, he talks about it's a perpetual covenant, perpetual ordinance. And as a matter of fact, he um, tells us that you will live righteously by the law. And in the last days, the lawlessness will be abounding in everywhere. I mean, uh, every place you look, it'll be lawlessness. Well, how do you define what lawlessness is? Lawlessness is rejection of the Bible, rejection of the Torah. Again, this would be actually what we call the Tanakh. It would be the Torah, the Nevaim, and the Ketuvim. These are the entirety of our Old Testament. Now, people tell me, oh my goodness, you're going under the law. No, sir. I don't do those things to be saved. I do those things because I'm saved. Do you know what? Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep the commandments. Now, I wonder what commandments you think he was talking about. It's not just the Ten Commandments, sir. He's talking about the entirety of the scriptures. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the laws and the prophets, for I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. This is called a true dichotomy. You see, sir, if God has not come to abolish, but to fulfill, the word abolish cannot mean anything like fulfill. That's what's called a dichotomy. They are opposite ends of the stick. Okay, so we work, look at that word there in the original Greek. That word is the word pleureo. Pleureo means to fully make it known, fully live it out, fully preach it, fully do it so we can see it being done. Why? So we can do it too. Because God is the fulfillment of the law. He did it perfectly so we could see it done, so we could walk as he walks. We are called to walk as our Messiah walks. Jesus never had a pork sandwich, sir. Why should I? 
As a matter of fact, the apostles, I can show you example after example of the apostles living according to the scriptures, exactly, including keeping the festivals, including Passover, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, uh, Yom Torah, which is the Day of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, all these different things. They did them. Why? Because we are commanded to in Leviticus and also Deuteronomy. These are a covenant between God and us. And this is very important. If you break the covenant, then you have a problem. Now, again, the covenant itself that we are now in as being saved uh, Christians, as a Christian, I don't keep these things to be saved. Once again, if I never uh, keep another Sabbath, if I never uh, uh, adhere to another festival or, or keep a festival, if I go out and eat all the bacon on the planet, does that damn me to hell? No, sir, it does not. But again, in Luke, it talks about those who have been forgiven much, love much. Do you know what? I've been forgiven a whole lot. I'm a former adulterer, a former fornicator, a former drug addict. I, you know, you name it, I've done it. When Paul said he was the chief of sinners, he didn't know me. So, sir, I've been forgiven a whole lot. And because I've been forgiven a whole lot, I want to do everything I even think God wants me to do. And the way I read the scripture is the law is not changed, and as such, I'm going to keep it. If you don't want to keep it, sir, that's on you, not me. Jesus said, if, if this, then that. If you love me, then you will keep the commandments. The opposite is also true. If you do not love me, you will not keep the commandments. But thank you for the question. Anybody else? Uh, can I ask a question, Mr. Batman? Well, I don't know if you can or not, sir. If you're asking permission, that would be may yeah, I. Ask a question. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry. That's the teacher in me just trying to teach you some English. Yes, sir. What's your question? Uh, do you believe someone has to be circumcised to be a good Christian? No, sir. No, sir. Circumcision, according to the scripture, again, is on the eighth day after your birth if you are born in one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, sir, again, there's 10 lost tribes out there. We don't know, even know who there are. So the only ones we really know of right now are Judah or where we get the word Jews, Judea, that is the root of Judah. Uh, it's actually pronounced uh, Yehuda in the original Hebrew. Um, again, and then there's Benjamin. Uh, but once again, that would be eight days after your birth, then you're circumcised. Now, in Acts chapter 15, I believe it is, the Jerusalem Council, you can look this up yourself. Um, Peter's actually talking, is it Peter or Paul? Oh my goodness, I'm tired, it's been a long day. Um, anyway, in Acts chapter 15, it's talking about how, um, what are these people, the very first thing, let's go look it up. As a matter of fact, before I get messed it up, let's look it up. Let me get up here. Um, in Acts chapter 15, the very first thing that's said is uh, the people, or, or the, the people of the circumcision. Well, what is that? These are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And again, they are telling those people that you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. No, sir. And as a matter of fact, Paul even uh, uh, refers to that and says, no, that's not the case. Um, again, why are you putting a burden on people that even our fathers could not bear? Let me go ahead and get this up here real quick. And, and that is Acts, I believe it is chapter 15. I could be wrong. It has been one long day, and I've not even finished my first cup of coffee, so that's never good. Oh, no, Acts, F F I love Acts 15, chapter 1. But some men came down from Judea. Ju Yehuda, that's where we get the word Ye Jew, <clears throat> and we're teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be circumcised. Well, let's just stop right there. The custom of Moses, that's the Torah. So according to the Torah, it's on the eighth day. But wait a minute. If these guys are coming to Christianity and they're, they're starting to follow the Messiah, then um, are, have they passed the eighth day? Yep, they sure have. And so if you go down and look at that, but some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees, this is Acts 15, 5, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them according, uh, in order for them to keep the law of Moses. Again, they're referring to the Torah. They're very Torah observant. But again, this is called legalism. This is called Judaism. This is, that's why they were called uh, the people of the circumcision because they thought you had to do these things in order to be saved. Sir, there's nothing you can do to be saved other than uh, repent. And repentance is stop sinning, turn around and stop being a sinner. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, this is Acts 15, 8, by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed 
their hearts by faith. Now, this is called circumcision of the heart. This is very important because it's not the circumcision of the flesh that saves you. It's the circumcision of the heart that saves you. And we'll go, I'll talk to you about that in just a second. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Uh Uh-oh, that's kind of a problem. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus just as they will. Uh Uh-huh. And after this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. This is Acts 15, 16. That the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. That remnant word is very important. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known of old. Therefore, my judgment, and again, here we go. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles. Gentiles, that word there is goyim. That means of the nations who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols. Uh Uh-oh, where's that come from? From sexual immorality. Mm -mm, there, There we go. That's another thing. And from what has been strangled and from blood. Where does all this come from? This is all from the Tanakh, the Torah. For from ancient generations, Moses, again, the law, has had in every city those who proclaim him, again, the law, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. That's the Torah. Now, this is what Jesus himself was preaching when he was on this planet. Let's go look at Ezekiel chapter 18. And let me see here. It might help if I could see it. Ecclesiastes, Ezekiel, there we go. Ezekiel chapter 18. And it says, the soul that sins shall die. Now, wait a minute. What do you mean by repeating this Proverbs concerning the land of Israel? Now, we got to understand something real quick. We, the church, those who follow Christ, who follow Messiah, are Israel. We are grafted into Israel because Jesus himself said he has only come for the lost sheep of Israel. So, Uh, As I declare, oh, let me go a little further, okay? Uh, Ezekiel 18, verse 5, if a man is righteous and does what is just and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains, uh uh-oh, this is pagan idolatry, or lift up his eyes to idols of the house of Israel. See, that's what they did. As a matter of fact, if you look at Jeremiah chapter 3, it talks about how they were whoring around on every high hill under every green tree with every false god they could get with. How easy can I say that? does not defile his neighbor's wife and approach uh, a woman in her time of menstrual impurity, again, that's the blood, does not oppress anyone, but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry, and covers the naked with a garment, does not lend at interest or take any profit, withholds his hand from injustice, executes true justice between man and man, walks in my statutes, and keeps my rules by acting faithfully, he is righteous." He shall surely live, declares the Lord God. Okay, now let's go down a little further. Yet you say, why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? This is Ezekiel 18, 19. When the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to observe all my statutes, he shall surely live. The soul whose sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Now, once again, this gentleman asked me earlier uh, about evil. This is how you know what is evil and good, only from the Torah, only from the word of the living God, the Bible. When I say Torah, I'm talking about, again, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the New Testament. You cannot know one without the other. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. You cannot know one without the other. Now let's look at Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 21. But if a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes, this is called repentance. This is what Jesus meant by repentance. Not just a change of mind, not just believing it in your mind, but believing it in your heart. The circumcision of the heart causes you to act differently, causes you to be different. If you're still going out there and doing the same things you've always done, have you been saved? You might want to question that. Uh, from all his sins and he is committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him for the righteousness that he has done he shall live. That is repentance. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to preach true repentance. 
I hope I answer your question, sir. Thank you, Mr. Batman. Quite welcome. Anybody else? I think our host's internet is kind of going wonky on him. I'm familiar with how that works because my internet sometimes go, goes in and out as well. But again, we have to understand why this is important, why repentance is important, why Messiah himself had to die for us. Um, let's go back to, again, the scriptures and look. I believe it's in Jeremiah chapter 3. Oh, yeah. Faithless Israel. You see, we are Israel. We are Israel, and again, when um, again it uh, talks of in Romans chapter seven, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's wife, will he return to her? Would not the land be greatly polluted? You have played the whore with many lovers. He's talking to Israel. He's talking to us. He's talking to us idolaters or following other gods or following things that we make up ourselves. That's atheism. And would you return to me? Declares the Lord. Lift your uh, lift up your eyes to the bare heights and see where have you not been ravished by the waysides you have set awaiting lovers like an arab in the wilderness uh oh that's an insult you have polluted the land with your vile whoredom again this is not very good guys so the lord says and again this is jeremiah chapter 3 verse 6 the lord said to me in the days of king josiah have you seen what she did again talking about israel that faithless one israel that's us how she set up on every high hill under every green tree and there played the whore. That's being unfaithful. That's why God is perfectly faithful. And I thought after she had done all this, she would return to me, but she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah, again, that's the Jewish nation, saw it. She saw that for all the adulteries of that faithless one, Israel, and I sent her away with a decree of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she too went and played the whore. Because she took her whoredom lightly, she polluted the land committing adultery with stone and tree. This is idolatry. Stone and tree under every green tree on every high hill. That's what that means. Yet, for all her treacherous uh, sister, for all her treacherous sister, uh, did not return to me with all her whole heart. But in pretense, see, that's what Judaism is. In pretense, they have a form of godliness that is not godliness. And the Lord said to me, Faithless Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Why? Mm. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord, and I will not look on you in anger. What's it mean, return? It means it means repent. It means turn from your wickedness, turn from following false gods, following false idols, following your own way, and follow the way, the truth, and the, the life. That's John 14, 6. For I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt. That's repentance. That's acknowledging that you've done what is wrong, that you rebelled against your Lord, the Lord your God, and scattered your favors. That is, you were unfaithful among foreigners under every green tree that you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. So once again, this is why God had to die because we are married to him. He's our husband and we've been unfaithful. But wait a minute, God cannot break his own law. So again, it says throughout the scripture that God is gonna reconcile Israel to himself. How can he do that when he just said that he cannot do that because he's divorced us? Because the husband has to die. Let's look at Romans chapter seven. And this all goes together perfectly when you look at it correctly. Romans chapter 7, release from the law. Or do you not know, again, this is Paul, or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, the Torah, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For here, We were talking about marriage earlier. For a married man, uh-oh, see, we were just talking about the law in Jeremiah 3. For a married man is bound to the law, bound by law to her husband. For a married woman, I'll get it out here in a second. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Whoa, that's why Messiah had to die. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. Uh-oh, that's what we were just called in Jeremiah chapter 3. We were called whoredom, adulterers. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Okay, 
This is why God had to die. This is why Jesus is God in the flesh, because Jesus is our husband. That's why in uh, all through the scripture, it talks about him as the bridegroom and us, the church, Israel, is the bride. We are the bride of Messiah. We are the bride of God himself. I hope that explains a little bit. Any other questions? Okay, I have a question. Um, what does God's chosen people mean exactly? Ah, oh. Uh, the chosen people are those he chose to be the light to the world. This would be Israel, but Israel shirked their duty. They hid the light underneath a, a, a basket. They put it underneath their bed. They didn't go out and preach repentance. Uh, you, did you know that uh, there's a story in the Bible called Jonah? And Jonah did this. He didn't want to go preach repentance. And what did God do? Um, God pointed that out to him, that you need to do this. And again, this is why God says, and this is why God judged, judged the nation. He sent them into bondage. He didn't do, they, or excuse me, Israel didn't do what they were supposed to do. He sent them into the bondage of slavery in Egypt. I think my internet's wonking out. Oh, there we go. Um, again, he sent them into the bondage, into slavery, into Egypt. Every place in, when you talk about uh, Egypt, it, it refers to sin. You know, you, you go into the bondage of sin. And when you're released of that bondage, you're free of sin. That's why God takes us out of Egypt through the Red Sea. That's your baptism. You go through the Red Sea, the baptism of the Red Sea, so you can walk according to the Messiah, walk according to God's law, God's Torah. Okay, Batman. Yes, sir. As I was asking, um, uh, do I have to like type in so or something? Or no, sir, I can hear you. Go ahead. You're fine. Okay. Um, so, I was wondering, right, about Mormonism, right? And uh, I have a friend that says he's Christian, but also he, he's a part of the Mormon church, mm -hmm. but he's also a Christian. That doesn't work that way, sir. Those are what's called diametrically opposing positions. It's like um, saying a one-ended stick. That doesn't work. Um, a square circle. That doesn't work. Military intelligence. Doesn't work. Those things do not exist. If you are yeah. going to be a Christian, then you must follow what Christ said to follow. He said, if yeah, you he love me, he follows Christ. So I'm sorry, sir. So no, he, he doesn't. Does. No, he doesn't. Ask he him, does. ask him, well, you know what? I don't care what he says, sir. I don't really don't care. The fact of the matter is Mormons believe in multiple gods. It is a form yeah. of polytheism. Yes, sir. Ask them yeah, if they can sir. become, sir, don't interrupt me. Please don't do that. Sorry. Thank you. I'm trying to answer your question. So once again, they believe that they can become a form of God. Um, they have all these different extra biblical beliefs. It's no different than again, let's say the Roman Catholic Church or um, the Judaism. Judaism adds things to it. That's called Takanot or Messiim. Where do you think the Roman Catholic Church got it? They got it from the Sadducees and the Pharisees because that's what they were doing. Jesus says in Mark chapter seven, let's go ahead and look at that real quick because I am so tired, I don't trust my own memory. And because I have had a brain injury, I don't like to trust it too much. Okay, Mark chapter seven. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? Uh-oh, that's kind of important. Why does it not say, why do your disciples not walk according to the Torah, the law? Why didn't it say that? Oh, because they weren't doing anything wrong, but eat with defiled hands. Show me in the scripture, where it says you have to wash your hands a particular way and say a particular prayer. Mm -hmm. There's not in there. So, and he said, Jesus, Jesus, red letter words, boys and girls, this is always important. And Jesus said to them, and he said in his most kind and passionate voice, he said, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain, vanity and selflessness or selfishness, they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandments of God and hold to the traditions of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. That's what Jesus came to do away with. That's why Jesus said, my burden is light. My yoke is easy. Because these Sadducees and Pharisees, just like the Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and the Roman Catholic Church, they add things to the scripture that are contradictory. Did you know what, sir? Your worldview must be completely consistent. If it is inconsistent in any fashion or form, it is wrong. 
You know why I know that, sir? Because all contradictions are wrong. Mormonism has a plethora of contradictions. So does Jehovah's Witnesses, so does the Roman Catholic Church, so does everything that denies the Bible. Contradictions are always wrong. This violates a known law of logic. It's called the law of non-contradiction. So hard to remember. Let's think about this. If I was to say to you, my car is and is not in the parking lot right now, is that statement true? No, it's not. It can't be. It's a contradiction. Exactly. It doesn't make any sense. And neither does making it up as you go along. That's what religion is. Religion makes up stuff as they go along. That's what Jesus came to do away with is religion. He came to give you a relationship. He came to make you his holy, righteous, and clean bride. Not to give you laws, not to give you regulations, but to make you holy, which means to be set apart. Okay. Yeah, no. Um, I'm not the Mormon, though. Okay. So, um, I just get passionate, uh, sir. I'm, I'm not, but, I, sir, if you're not yeah. the Mormon, you, just ha you now have enough information to go refute the Mormon. So do you have any other yeah. questions? Um, yeah, I have one more. Okay. Okay, so he was saying also that Christians teach uh, people to tolerate gays. I'm sorry, sir. No, they don't. We, we yeah. love people. You know what? We love them enough to tell them that they're going to hell if they don't repent. You know what? <laughs> I love people enough to tell them that. You know what? If I didn't love them, I wouldn't go down and get assaulted you know, a half a dozen times in six hours. Why would I do that if I don't care? Sir, it's not about me. And that, if you're doing it because of yourself, then that's called a vain philosophy, a vain theology, a vain reason. Vanity is for yourself. I don't do it for myself, sir. I do it for them. And you know what? If, it had some, if somebody had not done that for me, guess what? I would still be in my sin. There but for the grace of God, that would be me. Had somebody not preached the gospel to me, guess what? I'd still be a sinner. I'd still be on my way to hell. But I'm not. I'm no longer a sinner. I'm, I'm a former sinner saved by the grace of the living God. I have committed sin in the past. People say, oh, you say you're sinless. No, I'm not sinless. You can ask my wife. <laughs> She'll tell you I'm not sinless. The fact of the matter is, sir, I'm no longer a worker of iniquity. I don't go out and plan my next sin. That's what a worker of iniquity is. And you don't ever want to wake up after you die because that's what happens. You die and your next waking moment is standing before God, and you're going to hear one of two statements. Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your rest, which is eternity with God. Or, away from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. You don't want to hear those words. Damn, dude. All right. Thank you, sir. Anybody Thank else? You. Thank you, Batman. Anytime, sir. Love doing this. Okay, we're waiting on more questions. Anybody else have a question? Um, what is your opinion on primitivism, the idea that we should uh, do away with our technology and go back to how we were hundreds or thousands of years ago? Hmm. Um, I don't like it. I kind of like my technology. Um, and since it's not in the Bible, I'm not going to worry about it. But I don't like it because... I'm using technology right now to preach the good news of the gospel. Did you know last week I was actually in another chat talking with a person about um, their situation, a Christian, a fellow believer in Australia. And you think I'm ever going to get to Australia? I'm old and I don't like to travel as it is. I'm sure not going across that big pond. But you know what? Using this technology, I was able to witness to this man and invite him to our Bible study. And do you know what? He came. So we had a person in Australia, actually d downloaded the app and became part of our men's group on the other side of the planet. Wow, that's pretty cool. So I like technology. Anybody else? Yeah, what's your take on uh, Black Lives Matter protests? Oh, well, the protests themselves are um, just one more thing that shows us um, that we are being set up we, this is the last days. Uh, this is what the Bible calls the birth pangs. I believe it's referred to in the original Greek as the teleos. Um, again, that's the beginning of the end. You see, um, the word there in the Greek is like a word picture. It's a black dog that has a long black tail, but at the very tip of the black tail is, is white. 
and it's three and a half inches of that white tail. We're in the black portion of the tail right now. These things are happening. It's called the birth pangs. What happens when things happen according to birth pangs? You have a, a pain, then 20 minutes later, another pain, then 18 minutes later, another pain, and then 15 minutes later. See how they get quicker and quicker and quicker? And that's what we're yeah. seeing right now. This Black Lives Matter is no longer about black lives. It's become a religious movement. It was a, it first started off as a political movement, and now it's a religious doctrine. Because if you don't hold to it, they're going to punish you. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I agree. So, but the Bible says that all lives matter. That it doesn't matter who you are. That anybody be, can be grafted in if what? If they will obey and keep God's righteous rulings. That's the Bible. Where in the Bible does it say to go burn down somebody else's house because your great-great-grandfather was wronged in some fashion or form? It doesn't. So don't do it. Anybody else? I'm reading off the uh, some of the questions that people are asking you. So okay. someone asked, do Muslims go to hell? Depends on where they put their faith. I know former Muslims that have repented and f started following Messiah. No, but unfortunately, following Muslims like the Islam. Then, Islam then right. those people, they, those people, unfortunately, reject the living God. And when you reject the God that you know, and everybody knows God, that's Romans chapter one, starting at verse eighteen. For what can be known about God is plain to them who everybody. For God has shown it to them who everybody, namely His eternal power, His divine nature. Hold on to this one. His invisible attributes have been clearly perceived, clearly seen ever since the creation of the world. Now, again, sir, so that you have no excuse. Nobody has an excuse. Everybody knows the God of the Bible. Now, if you look in the Quran, like we looked at earlier in the Mormon doctrines, Jehovah's Witnesses, and also the Catholic doctrine, you've got contradictions. And any contradiction, your worldview is broken. You need a new one. So what I do is I actually quote Surah 6, verse 115, that talks about, again, um, that uh, in the Quran it talks about how God's, Allah's word cannot be corrupted, cannot be distorted. He is the God of truth or something like that. I can't remember exactly how it goes. Matter of fact, let me see. I think it's on my desktop. I'm, gonna, I'm butchering everything today. And let's see. Surah 6, verse 115. I got that part right. The words of Allah cannot be changed, and the word of your Lord has been fulfilled in truth and in justice. None can change his words, and he is the all-hearer and all-knower. Now, this is in the Quran, but wait a minute. You point this out to a Muslim and say, wait a minute. Your Bible says that the, the, the Torah, again, they'll talk about the first five books of the law, and then there's something they call the Injil, which is the Gospels. They'll say, oh, well, wait a minute. You can't follow those. Those are corrupted. And you point out, wait a minute. If they are the previous words of God, and that's what your book says, that the, the Bible, the Torah, and the Injil is the previous word of Allah, then the words of Allah cannot be corrupted. Wait a minute. That's a contradiction. They're saying in one point it can be corrupted and another point it can't. That's a, a, a contradiction. Contradictions are always wrong. My point is, if you want to know what a prophet looks like, see, they're going to tell you, well, you should follow the prophet Muhammad. That's a problem there. Because if you want to know what a prophet looks like, you know what you got to do? You got to go to the Bible. Oh, I love the Bible just because of this. So let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 13. And when we go to Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1, oh, here we go. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and that sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. Guess what? For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve and hold fast to him and him alone. Wow. So did Muhammad do that? No, he sure didn't. No, now guess what? He if he, Hang on a second. If he didn't do that, but that, you know, now we're going to look at Deuteronomy 13, 5. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God. That's what Muhammad should have had happen to him. Not a religious system built around him, but he should have been put to death for, for, for being a false prophet. But thank you for that question, sir. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Uh, yeah. Uh, what's your opinion on socialism? Well, sir, I don't have an opinion. 
Proverbs 18.2 says, A fool has no desire for understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Sir, I have the truth. That's Jesus Christ. John 14.6, Jesus says, He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Now, Jesus is actually quoting Psalm 119, verse 160 here, where he says, The sum of your word, that's all of it, the sum of your word is truth, and all of your righteous rulings endure forever. Now, sir, if you're going to engage in socialism or um, Marxism or Black Slavism or athe uh, atheism, any of those isms, then you have rejected the foundation of reality. Now, now we can talk about something other than Scripture because I can point to you that that doesn't work in the physical world either because if you are going to be a socialist, then you just rejected God and then you're going to have to explain some stuff. I got a train that's getting ready to go by. I live right next to a railroad track. But like if, you're, if your entire worldview is based on socialism and that's what basically you're saying, then how do you explain very necessary aspects of our physical world like laws of logic, laws of nature, and where time, space, and matter comes from? That's kind of a problem. Anybody else? Uh, well, socialism one. doesn't claim to be a worldview. Well, I'm sorry, sir. Anything that rejects the truth then becomes your worldview. Truth, by its very nature, is exclusive. That's why Jesus said the direct article. He didn't say, I am a way, I am not a truth, I am a life. He said the direct article. I am the way. There is no other way. There, I am the truth. There is no other truth. Truth by its very nature is exclusive. And I am the life. If you don't follow him, you're dead. That's eternal death, sir. That's called damnation in a place called hell. I don't want that for you or anybody else. Okay. Is, okay. is masturbation a sin? Yes, sir. That's called monosexuality. Any sex outside of the institution that God actually uh, created for man and woman is a sin. Actually, it's a perversion, just like we talked about earlier with the homosexual, with the perverts that are pedophiles or necrophiles or bestiophiles. This is also a perversion yeah. of the system. Okay, so, I, uh, so can I repent that? Yes, sir. You need to stop. I had a child, you, I had a child out, of, out of wedlock, dude. Well, yes, sir. I, I used to be a fornicator. I'm sorry, sir. Hang on just a second. I used to be a fornicator, uh, a masturbator, an adulterer. Sir, I, I've done it all. Now, the fact of the matter is, if you do these things, does that mean you're, you can never be saved? No. We just read in Ezekiel chapter 18 that the righteous, if he continues on in righteousness, will live. And if those who are unrighteous and will turn from their wicked ways, again, this is repentance. In the Greek, it's metanoia. And in the original Hebrew, it's called teshuva. It's a military about face. It's 180 degrees turning towards God and putting your back towards your sin. Now you're walking towards God. That's why it's called a Christian walk. Because the righteous man will fall seven times, but with the hand of God, get right back up every single time. What's that mean? Does that mean you're only going to mess up seven times? Heck no. I messed up a whole lot more than that. But every single time I mess up, God picks me up, puts me back on my feet, brushes me off and said, guess what? You just took three steps. Good job. Now, do better. Then I fall again after six. He picks me up, brush, brushes me off, says, you did a good job. You just took six steps. Now do better. You know what? If you love God, you will want to do better. This is Ezekiel chapter 36, starting around verse 24. Because once you get the gift of the Holy Spirit, it will not only give you the desire to, but the power to obey. Okay. Um, another question was, uh, if, if I'm getting, I'm going to get married before she's born though. Is that okay though? Sir, mm -hmm. um, that's not the issue. If you, if you are not married, you should not be having sex, period. Sex is designed to be, be between a man and a woman who are in the holy institution of marriage only. Now, if, she, if you've already committed the sin, then repent of yeah. it. That repentance means not to do it again. Now, again, if you're going to continue on in this sin, knowing that it's wrong, then guess what? There's no sacrifice left for you. If you continue to rebel against God, this is what's called the unpardonable sin. 
There, there's no sacrifice left for you if you know what is good, what is righteous, what is true, and what is holy, what you need to do, and then you don't do it. That, there is no sacrifice for you anymore because you have just seared the Holy Spirit. You're just going to continue on in your sinful ways. Now, I, want, I quoted Ezekiel chapter 36 earlier. Again, I will put my spirit within you. That's the, the heading. Ezekiel 36, 22. Therefore, say to the ha- house of Israel, who? Us, the church. The house of Israel. When you get grafted in, see, I'm not part of the bloodline of Israel. I'm grafted in. I'm grafted into the nation of Israel, the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And again, you go down here a little bit further, Ezekiel 36, 26, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. And I will put within you uh, I will, uh, excuse me, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. What does this mean? The heart that you currently have is a heart of stone. What did we talk about earlier? The, 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 when you were uh, worshiping stone, your heart of stone doesn't care about God, doesn't want to do what God wants you to do. But when you are truly brokenhearted, it says God loves a broken and contrite heart. If you are truly brokenhearted over your sin, guess what? God will take out that broken heart of stone. He'll give you a heart of flesh. Now this heart of flesh breaks for what breaks God's heart. And you know what? When you go out and you do something wrong, I, I look at the things I used to do and I used to laugh and that was so funny. And now look at that and I'm horrified that I used to do that. Ezekiel 36, 27. And I will put my spirit within you and that spirit will not just point you into the direction of the commandments. It will not just suggest that you keep the commandments. Read Ezekiel 36, 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness, all your uncleanness. And I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. Wow. God will bless you if you will simply obey his instructions. That instruction is called Torah, the Bible. Thank you for the question. All right. I have another question from a user. Okay. He asks, ask, um, has he watched Loli Hentai? Have you ever okay. watched Loli Hentai? No, sir. Uh, that's irrelevant. Uh, I don't really pay attention to much stuff like that. Because to be completely honest, um, I don't have time. I'm old, and I don't have time to waste. I don't play video games. I'm either studying the scripture, I'm teaching the scripture, or I'm working yeah. my new business with my wife. No, no, my wife Loli, and I just Loli started. Hentai. Loli Hentai is like some like uh, pet. I really don't care, sir. I don't really care. I don't really care. Like, like animation. Sir, I really do not care. The fact of the matter right. is, it is irrelevant. All right. Uh, do you think have- aliens are real? No, sir, because it says in Genesis 1-1 that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, this order is very important. In the beginning, God created the heavens. That's all of time, space, and matter. And then he created earth, unique and special. Why? Because he created that planet, earth, to house us, his bride, his crowning achievement. Now, sir, if you look at that very first verse in the Bible, this is very interesting. This is actually a scientific equation. This is why I love science. Did you know that you cannot do science without the God of the Bible? And let's look at the very first verse in the Bible. It says, in the beginning, that's time, God, the agent behind the creation, created the heavens, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. All time, space, and matter in the very first verse of the Bible. But it gets better than that, boys and girls. Because in Genesis 1, verse 2, it says, and the spirit of the Lord was hovering over the surface of the deep. Well, in Hebrews, it says, everything points to Messiah. Everything points to Jesus. How does this point to Jesus? Well, let's look at that. And the spirit of the Lord was hovering over the surface of the deep. That word hovering there in the original Hebrew is what we translate actually should be brooding, not hovering. Brooding is actually a farming term. It's what hens do to their eggs when they lay them. They warm them and spin them. They warm them and spin them. I want you to think about this. God created all time, space, and matter in verse 1, and he gave it all spin in verse 2. This is important. Why? Because every molecule, every planet, every solar system, every proton, neutron, electron, everything has spin to it. Wow. So God created all time, space, and matter in verse 1, and he gave it all spin in verse 2. And everything that was created was created by Jesus. It was everything that was created was created by him, for him, and through him. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, Yes, sir. 
Is Gluttony a sin, and if so, is Big Chungus a sinner? Well, I don't know who Big Chungus is. Gluttony, though, again, we have to define what that is. Um, if you're overweight, does that automatically make you a glutton? No, it doesn't. Do you know what? My wife and I recently lost a lot of weight. I don't know if you can see the video or not. Uh, probably not. Uh, but see this right here? Uh, those are called tendons. I never had those before because I've always been so fat. And it's, it's been a problem I've suffered with all of my life. Now, uh, have I changed a lot of things that I do? Absolutely. I've changed a lot of the different things that I do. Let me see if I can make that bigger. There we go. Um, so when we're talking about gluttony, um, again, if you are putting your faith in, your trust in, your hope in, your food, then you are glutton. That's idolatry. That's a form of idolatry. That's why the first commandment is the first commandment. You know, have no other gods before me. What's that mean? Well, don't put anything before God. Don't do anything that's important to you before it's important to God. I always, when I was teaching Sunday school, the main thing I always would ask those kids, what is your why? Why do you do what you do? Do you do what you do because you love yourself and you love your own desires and your own ways? Or do you do what you do because you love the living God and want to obey him? That's important. Mr. Brad, may I have a question? I have an answer, sir. Go ahead. What's your opinion on miscegenation? I have no idea what that is, sir. Um, it's basically a, a reproduction with the people considered di different racial groups. Well, I'm sorry, sir. Um, there's only one race. The Bible says very clearly there is one blood. So, sir, I don't know what you're talking about when you say different races. Are you talking about different ethnic groups, the way people look according to their particular yeah. outward appearance? And that, I guess that's the closest thing. That's what miscegenation laws apply to mostly. Okay. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that we are all created in the image of our creator and all people descend from those first two people that the creator created. That would be Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had a perfect genetic structure. That's why all the different variations that we see in the human race today come from those first two people because God gave them a perfect genetic structure. I want you to think about this. This is so cool. God created everything and he said, and it's very good. Wow. If God calls something very good, it's not as close to perfect as it can be, including your genetic structure. Do you know, and this is why I love science, do you know that we suffer from something called genetic entropy? Genetic entropy is the fact that with every successive generation, our offspring get less information. They inherit mutations. A mutation is a copying error of the existing working information. So if you get less information and less functionality, we are going to eventually get to what's called genetic catastrophe. That means eventually our biology will no longer be able to perform what it's supposed to perform, and that's reproduction. That means no more people. Now, sir, the fact of the matter is we know why this happens, because God cursed everything that is because of Adam and Eve's sin. Now, when God created everybody, uh, he created them perfect, created them as close to perfect as they could possibly be, they chose to sin against the God that they know. So God cursed them and cursed the, the, the planet. It cursed all of reality at that point. It all started to decay. Now, this is called entropy. This is the second law of thermodynamics, that everything decays over time. Everything goes from a state of order to disorder, from workable, usable energy and information to no workable, usable energy and information. Now, Again, there has to be some entropy in the system, or you couldn't do some very useful things like walking. There would be no friction. Um, you couldn't actually have any digestion. So there had to be some entropy in the system to begin with. But when Adam and Eve sinned, God pulled his hand away, his providential power of hand, his mighty arm, as the Bible calls it, away from creation and allowed much more entropy to hit the system. That's why we went from living for a thousand years to only living for less than a hundred. Oh, an another question to, to jump on the uh, UFO one. Um, how do you explain the UFO videos that the Pentagon put out there? I don't need to, sir. They're irrelevant. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to close out my live stream because I don't like to let them go over an hour. So let me close out the live stream and I'll go ahead and continue with our question and answer session. Give me just one moment, boys and girls, okay? Okay, thank you very much for joining us today at um, the Mr. Batman interview. It's been a very good interview, very good questions. Um, again, this is a Discord server that they set up just to interview me, and I really appreciate all these questions. Guys, if you have questions, 
you know, I don't know it all, but I know the God who knows it all. And if you want to have your questions answered, we'll seek out his holy word together and we will figure it out. Because you know what? You want to know the truth? Then you need to know Jesus because Jesus is the truth. Thank you very much for joining us. Repent or perish. Repent and believe the gospel. And visit my website at mrbatman.com for more information and more videos. God bless and have a good evening. All right. I think we are clear.